Hi, my name is Matt, welcome to Money Power, and um, this evening I want to talk about gearboxes um, because a lot of people, or I hear a lot of people, or I see a lot of people on forums and stuff like that, they're a bit scared of uh, splitting the engine that they have with um, a gearbox, gear bikes. So I've got a, it's a Kawasaki 250KX, I think. I can't remember, we've got loads of engines lying around. Um, but what I want to go over is we've got a clutch basket here. Um, that's a separate video, I'll go into clutches. Um, probably tomorrow or another video, that's a completely different video. Um, what I want to talk to you about is just, just gears and gearboxes and um, the makeup, a bit of how they work. Um, so basically, we've got a case and a half here with an input and an output shaft. And, um, the selector drum is missing, all the other bits and pieces are missing, like I say, the clutch. Because I'm not really going to go into that straight away, I just want to show you um, what a gearbox looks like and uh, what's in So there. this is your input the shaft, i.e. power going into the gearbox, and this shaft is the output shaft. And on the reverse of the output shaft is your splines here, where your sprocket goes. And then your chain, and then your rear sprocket, and the back wheel. So basically all there is in the gearbox is input shaft and output shaft, gear pairs and gears always have to be in pairs, if you have one gear turn on its own it's just literally a turning gear. Um, you also have the selector drum, another video we'll get to that, we have the two recesses for the guides for the selector forks, again we'll get to that. And basically there's just the rest of the housing is just to hold the bearings and that is it. So. When you come to split an engine, all this will be clustered together and all linked together. And if you just turn it upside down and then pull out, the whole thing should all come together. And there's bits you can cable tie together if you want to, etc. etc. And then you just lay it down like so. And uh, I'll bring you in. And like I say, literally, that's it. Look, there's just some bearings that are housed by these clips and then a um, needle bearing for the drum and some not even bushes, they are literally just drilled or milled straight into the awning and casing. Right, put that one side and I'll bring you in So closer. basically what we have is this is our gear sets. Like I say all gears come in pairs. Um, your input uh, your output shaft and your input shaft, these are the splines and then the threads on the end where the uh, nut goes on uh, to clamp your clutch on. Um, and the gears are in a, re a weird order, so this pair is first, this is second, this is third, this is fourth, and this is fifth. Um, as you can see, they're not exactly lined up, and I'll get to that in a second. So you are first, second, where are we? Third, fourth, and fifth. Now it seems like a weird arrangement, but it's basically just to distribute um, the force. If you you'd ride around more in first and second and third than you do um, or you, you you don't ride around more but there are chances are that you'd run, ride around more in first to second and third because you're stopping and starting especially you know city riding and all the rest of it um, so if we had first second third at this end what would happen is is there's always force going through one end of the gearbox and not the other so you'd start to warp out your bearings and everything so it's trying to distribute the um, the force around the box so the shaft isn't being driven one-sided kind of thing um, the reason why I can tell the one, two, three, four and five is literally because of the size number one is the smallest second biggest, third, fourth and fifth um, which correlates the other way around on your output shaft. So first is the biggest, second, third, fourth and fifth. Um, and basically if you add the diameter of both of them together on every single gear you will end up with exactly the same number. Otherwise the shaft won't line up, the shaft will step out. So. Um, and if you add the teeth together, they will probably be exactly the same because I think they're all the same pitch. Yeah, they look like it. If you add all the teeth together, so you add this set of teeth together and this set of teeth together, they will both be the same number. 
um, unless the gears are cut with a different um, module of teeth, but we won't get into that. So basically the way it works is that you have stationary gears, so the first gear here, if I turn the shaft, it turns with the shaft. I cannot turn it independent of the shaft. The second gears are freewheeling gears, so this isn't one I'm just putting it back on. Again, this is a stationary shaft, this moves with the shaft. I cannot move this gear without moving the shaft. The next gear is freewheeling gears, which are gears like this, they are completely independent of the shaft. So I can hold this still and the shaft spins. The next one are movable gears, which again are stationary shafts. Well, they're not stationary shafts, they're movable gears, but they are locked to the shaft. Might seem complicated at first. The next one, so if you look, you've got static, rotate, um, freewheeling, static again, freewheeling, and static again. Now, obviously, if you have six gears, it's not exactly like this arrangement. Um, but we'll just stick with what's what. So, just as we have static gears and freewheeling, um, freewheeling gears and static movable gears, on the output shaft usually they're opposite. So, first gear here is a static shaft, but on this side, first gear here is a freewheeling shaft, a uh, freewheeling gear. And it isn't that hard. This is where people get complicated trying to work out which gear to move where, because, like I said, we have these movable gears and they are meant to move on purpose. In this case we have three, most bikes you have three, unless you have less than, is it three gears? Three gears or less, um, which really isn't that many. <coughs> so basically the way it works is you want to engage first gear, so you imagine the shaft's turning, that means that number one gear, forget all the rest of them, number one gear here is turning with the input shaft. So when you rev the engine, this shaft rotates, this gear rotates. But it hits this gear and this gear just free wheels so your shaft, your output shaft, your rear wheel does nothing it's only when with your, when you change gear, when you select first gear this movable gear here moves and locks in to this gear so look when I turn when I turn, now when I try to turn it it's solid and then the whole thing turns so the power is going through these teeth, through this teeth, I've selected first which is actually the fifth gear but because it locks into it now and because fifth gear is static to the shaft the power is going through this gear and this gear and it rotates at that speed um, so second, we want second gear, well second gear is a static gear again just like first so the whole thing spins but when you get to the, the uh, output the output a second gear, this again is a freewheeling gear. So this selector comes across, and I'll show you how the select in a minute. But the selector fork, your selector drums and selector forks moves this gear across, and now when I turn it, the power transfers to this gear and turns the shaft. Now it all depends which gear is locked into which gear. You have to have both locked to the shaft, so that's why these movable gears are important. And I'll show you how these movable gears work. If we take off second gear, it has a sleeve on the inside, so this can rotate freely, so, which means it can rotate freely on the shaft. But what happens is, is that you have these gaps. On this side it's flat, on this side you have these recesses, and these are dog recesses. On the th third gear, on the third gear, movable gear, you have these, which are dogs, these protrusions. And this gear is splined, and so is the shaft. So this means when one turns, it turns with the other. Like so. The shaft has to move with this gear. The whole thing's coming apart, which is a pain in the ass. So basically what happens is, is even though this is a freewheeling gear, when the dogs come across, and I'll try and get this on camera, when they come across they engage into the recesses, locking the gears together. Now, the only you think we're lying about, lots of them could be locked into each other, etc, etc, and you've still got the first gear which is static, but if this gear is not locked, then the first gear isn't driven, driving this shaft. It is basically, when you're in second gear, um, 
first gear and second gear and third gear are all uh, turning. But when you look on the output shaft, second gear is freewheeling. Uh, no, first gear is freewheeling. Second gear has now been locked because this selector's move across. And third gear in the middle is freewheeling. So it is only the second gear which is transferring rotation from this shaft to this shaft. And that's how it works. When you move a selector fork into first, it doesn't just move one gear, it disengages other ones, and vice versa. So you need to un disengage one and move another. I'll go into selector drums later, that's an entirely different video on its own. But basically the whole thing is switching around, and that's what people can't get their heads around. People can't get their heads around is, well, if I'm changing into first, why are we moving third gear? on the output shaft etc etc. It's not what is moving that's important, it's how the power is transferred and which gear is locked to the shaft. These gears like uh, third and um, fourth and fifth are always locked to the sh on the output shaft but their counterpart on the input shaft, these two, are freewheeling until they're engaged by this middle gear and this gear has uh, dogs on either side, and that recess, you can see that that recess is where the, it literally it's a fork that sits in between and moves it either side. So either goes one, either goes into the middle, so neither are engaged. Let's see if I can do that. That's not engaged, that's not engaged. Or it moves into position one, which is that one, and now we're locked. Or it moves that way and it moves into this position and that's locked. The reason why there's some slop, you'll see that the gauge is in, and then there's some slop, that's to give the bike or give the gearbox a chance to rotate and pick up speed and then catch the gear. If you are trying to fit a dog into a perfect dog shaped hole um, it would never have a chance to slide because it's as things are rotating it's got to slide and catch in the hole before it can rotate. So if we take it apart you have gears that are splined and then you have circlips and washers behind them to keep them from moving that gear, it's got a circle up on the other side as well, so that keeps that freewheeling exactly where it is. The other thing as well, as well is that the splines have been machined off at this point, so it is freewheeling on this side. So this entire, this entire section is all locked together, there's only one gear that's free to come off. Um, but these again, washers, and they're all held in place by bearings. This um, end of the shaft here is for a, to sit into a bearing. Um, this one, we can get we can take off first gear, we can take off fifth gear, I believe, and that one's locked, so you can go the other way, take off that and take off the sleeve, and take off the movable gear. So the output shaft has basically got gear, let's see if I can get this right, fifth gear, that is fifth gear, but again, that's a freewheeling gear, and it's these splines which lock one gear onto the other. Now what is important is, as you can see, these splines, there's a lot more of splines on this side than there is this side. That's because of the function of um, which gear it's interlocked into. This gear is a stationary gear, uh, not a stationary gear, sorry, this gear is a movable gear, but this is for second gear locking and fifth gear, so it depends what kind of torque that it has to take of why, how many splines that it has. Um, first gear is quite a um, low torque application gear, so it can have fewer splines, where the one in the middle is selecting oh, fourth and third gear, so this gear has to basically take a bit more um, torque, so there's more splines and a larger diameter shaft. And it's basically as simple as that. Um, some of these gears have um, brass bushes, if you can see that, if you'll focus, I can't tell. Brass bushes on the inside that can be replaced, they've got little oil dimples so they can hold some oil. Um, these shafts, this shaft is quite hollow down to a point to try and lighten it up. Um, but basically that is it. When you start taking these gearboxes completely apart, you start popping circlips off and all the rest of it, yes it does, you know, unless you've got the manual, unless you label everything precisely, which, you know, um, is something you should always do. There isn't much to it, there are literally just two shafts. You don't have to understand the entire process perfectly to assemble or reassemble or even replace a gear. Um, as you can see here, this is 
second gear output shaft and as you can see I have some wear across the top where the dogs have glanced and danced over the top but it's also made this impression here which means someone's been a bit heavy with uh, second gear which will sometimes cause the gear to slip a bit uh, when trying to engage it. The other thing is if you see wear like that then you should check the dogs and check that the dogs uh, what damage they have on them and this is the gear and you can see you've got the same kind of you got the same kind of wear on that edge and again and again and again always on one side on one edge obviously the other side that being reversed so it doesn't see any action um, and it's pretty much the same story everywhere you can just see see if I can get you in there you can just see the wear on the inside of there and the wear on the inside of the dogs there and basically um, you just check and see what the wear is and if you're happy to replace them, replace them and if you're not really that bothered and it doesn't seem to have much problem then don't worry about it too much um, do be aware that some of these dogs do break off and if a dog breaks off it is going to absolutely wreak havoc <laughs> on your gearbox um, you'll also see interestingly enough some of these gears are stepped so you can see that they have a little step in this is to uh, aid in um, engagement for some of the gears so basically they'll do a bit of a, um, a follow up on the design of the bike and they'll, they'll get one in that's 10 years old and they'll test it and then they'll see ah well you know third and fourth are a bit a bit edgy um, in the transition and they'll pull it apart and they'll stick it in a clear case a clear case in that perspex basically just a box with bearings and then they'll see they'll speed it up and they'll get a slot they'll um, change gears um, on a test bed and um, then they'll say ah that you know that we could do with taking that edge off because that's just a bit too aggressive it's uh, pressure relieving um, but yeah we'll move on to clutches and selector forks selector drums and selector forks they're a bit they're a bit harder to get your head around um, when you first ever see one but uh, yeah stick around we'll do some more videos like I say we'll do the clutch next the clutch is pretty easy and uh, I'll show you how that works and how it engages and all the parts and how it's put together. Alright then, I'll see you in a bit.